Got the Uxx ones outside the window. Mm. Good morning, everyone. Now it's good. Uh, my name is Moritz von Unger. I am with Silvestrum, and, and I am the moderator of this event uh, this morning. I'm very honored uh, to have been asked um, to, to walk through this session on uh, wetlands and the decade for wetland restoration. Uh, this is the second of three events organized by the Secretariat um, of the Convention on Wetlands here at COP26. Uh, last week's event focused on finance, um, and on Wednesday we will have another event that's on an, uh, synergies between the different conventions. Um, at 1700, here in this, um, in this pavilion. So today we are talking about wetland restoration, one of the most important and significant um, um, events that have to happen um, if we want to reach the, the two degree, uh, well below two degree, 1.5, ideally 1.5 degree scenario. Um, so wetlands, wetlands uh, show really the, uh, uh, wetlands show like the, the, the crisis of uh, biodiversity, first and foremost, of uh, land degradation and of climate. Um, so it's really important that we all here at the climate conference talk about talk about wetlands. Um, uh, the event is convened by the international organization uh, partners of the convention, um, and we discuss wetland restoration. I invite, and I'm I'm really pleased to invite uh, Martha Rojas Orrego, Secretary General of the Convention on Wetlands, to deliver opening remarks. Thank you, Moritz, and welcome to everyone. I'm very pleased uh, to be uh, welcoming you all to this event, uh, which is very timely, as uh, we are at COP26, and we know uh, the need for ambition to achieve the Paris Agreement is huge. And we know also that the nature has an important role to play. And I have to say that this is the first COP where nature is really uh, being given uh, the level of attention that it requires because we know that without nature, we will not be able to achieve uh, the goals uh, of the Paris Agreement. And, and wetlands has a critical role to play in this regard, because this is the ecosystem that is most efficient in terms of carbon store. Uh, we know that wetlands store 30% of land-based carbon, and they play a very important and unique role in terms of adaptation and resilience uh, to extreme events. Wetlands are also the source of water. We depend on wetlands for water. So without water, we cannot have anything else. Uh, so they are absolutely critical for livelihoods and for life, including, uh, as you were saying, Moritz, uh, biodiversity, as wetlands host 40% of the world's uh, biodiversity, of the, of the world's species. But wetlands are also our most threatened ecosystem today. We have lost 87% of wetlands since industrialization, and, and we have lost 35% since 1970. The rate of loss is three times faster than that of forests. So we need to give attention to this important ecosystem as with its loss, we are also losing our water security and our most powerful nature-based uh, solution for adaptation and mitigation. So protection of wetlands is as important as ever, but without rapid, rapidly scaling up restoration, we simply will not be able to meet our global climate goals. And I would like to refer to one of the findings of our technical panel, the scientific and technical review panel, which is uh, launching a, a briefing and technical report on restoring peatlands. And they have shown that to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees, we need to protect peatlands and restore at least half of what we have lost by 2030. This is 25 million hectares. We are in a very important moment as well as we uh, just launched the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. And this provides a huge opportunity to make real change so that we can harness the power of wetlands at scale. So we can only achieve this if we build on existing instruments and if we use key partnerships for this. And actually, when we look at instruments, um, as you know, the Convention on Wetlands is focused on this particular ecosystem, and it's an important platform for achieving the goals of the Convention, the goals of biodiversity, but also those of the Paris Agreement. This convention has been ratified by 172 countries, and it's a legal framework. So it's, it, it is a platform of governmental action. 
The convention has adopted critical decisions uh, in the last COP on peatlands and blue carbon, and they have encouraged all the parties to integrate peatlands and blue carbon in the NDCs. The countries have also uh, defined and agreed to have a specific target on restoration of degraded wetlands with the purpose of biodiversity conservation, disaster risk reduction, livelihoods, and climate change. The convention also provides the largest protected area network through wetlands of international importance that are designated by parties. And I would like to give you a very concrete example on, on what it means in terms of impact. So we know that mangroves are one of the most important ecosystems for mitigation, as well as for coastal protection and for livelihood support. We have around 300 wetlands of international important, uh, importance designated. These are also known as Ramsar sites that include mangroves. And what we see is then in, in average, although we are still losing mangroves at, at a very fast rate, the rate of loss within these Ramsar sites is one order of magnitude lower than rates of loss outside. So obviously this means that there is an impact when countries commit and take a specific measure such as this one uh, to protect these important wetlands. And I said that we needed to use existing uh, instruments, but also that we need to use key partnerships. And I have to say that the, the convention is very fortunate to have a unique partnership in having recognized, so the countries of the convention have recognized six organizations as strategic international organization partners to the convention. And these are BirdLife International, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, the International Water Management Institute, IMI, Wetlands International, the Wild Fall and, Wet and Wetlands Trust, WWT, and the, Wild the Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF. So as you see, these are the largest organizations and it's a unique partnership of organizations committed throughout their network, throughout the, net, the science that they develop and the action that they take to support and promote the, con the conservation of wetlands and the implementation of the convention by bringing the strengths, knowledge and reach of each one of these IOPs. So I am extremely pleased to be organizing this event jointly with our IOPs uh, to the convention and I look forward to continued and deepened collaboration uh, in our common goals of scaling up action for wetland restoration and conservation to achieve our shared biodiversity, climate and sustainable development goals. So I look forward to a very interesting uh, discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, Martha. Uh, this, this, this was really helpful and, and wonderful. Before moving on, uh, we have um, we have so this is a virtual event. There's also um, there's also you know an audience, a virtual audience um, that can bring in questions that um, that we hopefully can can um, can pull into the session uh, later on. Uh, we are moving on. Uh, we have a, a second keynote uh, from Dr. Bat, who's senior advisor of one of the most important countries uh, when we talk about uh, nature restoration, uh, which is India. And we're extremely happy that um, he could find the time in this uh, in this awfully um, uh, you know loud and busy uh, conference. Um, we are going to have a video, but Dr. Bhatt, um, uh, we'll say we'll say one or two minutes. Uh, we'll have an introduction. Um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And uh, my brothers and sisters from all over the world who are both online and offline, thank you for sparing your valuable time and being with us. At the outset, I bring to you greetings from India. And we welcome this very important initiative on the wetlands. <clears throat> India takes its responsibilities and commitments under the multilateral process with utmost seriousness. Secretary General just spoke about nature and I am tempted to quote from the logo of my ministry in New Delhi in India. 
the logo was the logo which cbd cop had adopted the 12th session which was held in hyderabad so the logo said nature protects if she is protected nature cannot be taken for granted and the logo is in sanskrit the ancient language of my land it says prakruti rakshati rakshita she protects if she is protected well in india we have more than 700070 wetlands 770000 wetlands are in india measured by by the remote sensing studies and these have been referred to as incomparable lands in our texts india has also notified the wetland conservation and management rules to protect the wetlands and by this legislation all states and uts in india have dedicated wetland authorities also aligning the rules to wise use india has designated 46 wetlands as ramsar sites which is the largest network in south asia and at this point i would uh, i would say very proudly that india speaks from a position of strength when it speaks on wetland conservation and wise use india has uh, as a part of our commitment to the international community india held two very important cops one the un ccd cop 14 in new delhi from 2nd to 3rd september and also the cop of the bonn convention on migratory species in february 2020 and uh, both were directly and indirectly also related to wetland conservation and wise use the second one especially the bonn convention on migratory species cop was uh, also in recognition of the central asian flyway and the 230 or, or, or more than 200 feathered friends 200 feathered 200 species of feathered friends who visit india through their migratory route the central asian flyway in recognition of that that conference had productive deliberations i stand before you humbly and i want to uh, at the end say that under the prime minister's transformative idea program a four prong strategy including brief documents wetland health assessments wetland mitra uh, the friends of wetland that we have uh, you know the idea that we have undertaken and management planning have all been launched in all districts of the country and we also have a national portal on wetland which has been released in just in october 2021 to provide access to information on wetlands to all stakeholders and citizens with these words i uh, am to say that we are committed to the cause of wetlands both their conservation protection as well as their wise use in alignment with the ramsar convention thank you for your patient hearing and we look forward to very productive deliberations and thank you for giving us a chance to be with you and share our ideas thank you Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, thank you for these uh, welcoming words. We are going to have uh, a video that Dr. Bhatt brought with us, and after that, we have another video. Um, so, so it's um, stay tuned. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is a presentation from Government of India to uh, showcase the wetlands conservation efforts that have been launched in in recent times. 
especially under the Prime Minister's uh, program. Uh, India has a very rich wetland heritage as per our uh, 2011 National Wetlands Atlas, which was developed using remote sensing and extensive grant briefing. We have uh, 0.77 million wetlands, roughly 4.7% uh, of the country's area is under wetlands. These wetlands play a critical role in achieving our water, food and climate security and sustainable development. And thereby conservation and management of wetlands is a high policy and programming priority of Government of India. There is a national wetlands program in operation since 1985. The program builds on an inclusive governance agenda wherein the central government supports state governments in implementing, designing and implementing site management programs. Capacity development is an important constituent wherein range of stakeholders are trained in applying integrated wetland management and advancements of science uh, to the cause of wetlands conservation and wise use. Uh, research and development is supported. We also have a regulatory framework in the form of a, a wetlands conservation and management rules which derive from Environmental Protection Act and the international cooperation with Ramsar, with CMS and Convention on Biological Diversity provides the framework for our international commitments on wetlands. India ratified the convention in 1982 and is committed to the goal of conserving and wisely using all wetlands in our territory. We have designated 46 wetlands to the list of wetlands of international importance and are uh, uh, at least 8% of India's known wetland regime is, uh, as, is a part of the international network which is currently the largest in South Asia. Under the transformative idea of Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister 100 Days Program, uh, we launched a four-pronged targeted approach. The first part of it which was preparing basic information on ecosystem services and biodiversity values of wetlands, including their threats and regulation needs, doing a quick health check in terms of a wetland ecosystem health card, uh, constituting stakeholder platforms to enable citizens to participate in wetland management, and, there, and finally ending up in planning uh, a very clear, laying down a clear management plan for achieving wetlands conservation and wise use. Uh, this is uh, a snapshot of, in the first phase, we took 130 wetlands and a snapshot of health assessment. These were graded from A plus to E, uh, with A plus being the best score and E uh, being the wetlands requiring priority attention, which helped us focus on, on priorities, which is shown in, in the right map. Now these are translated into management approaches with wetlands which are having low health as well as high threats. The management is targeted at health and threats wherein we have high health and uh, uh, high uh, threat scores. We uh, manage for threats in quadrants, uh, wetlands which are lying between in the quadrants with low threat score but high health score, we focus more on monitoring and wherein we have low health scores, we focus more on managing for wetland ecosystem health. This allowed us to target management uh, to the specific needs. Uh, the Friends of Wetlands or Wetland Mitras as we call uh, is an informal, informal voluntary and non-statutory network of concerned citizens who partake in uh, assessing wetland ecosystem health and defining management strategies. In this way, not only do the citizens gain an opportunity in shaping wetland management, they also build their capacity in implementing management in the framework as decided by management plans. So in the first phase, all wetlands had uh, wetland mitras network constituted for the site. We are also internalizing a diagnostic approach, which is also advised by Ramsar in management planning and uh, right from setting a clear goal and purpose to investigating the wetland ecosystem ecological character and defining a context and site specific action plan is, uh, is a process that has been adopted in the priority wetlands and central government provides financial support to the state governments under centrally sponsored schemes to implement this management. There is also an active capacity development process attached to this wherein stakeholders are trained in drafting management plan. 
from the experiences of the first phase this is now rolled out to all districts of india on the basis of four pronged approach and now the program is spearheaded by state wetland authorities there is a network of knowledge uh, partners including iop representatives wetlands international south asia wwf to support uh, wetland management process and different government programs such as the national mission on clean ganga of jal shakti mantralay are also using this four pronged approach to effectively roll out wetlands conservation at a larger scale in uh, march uh, 2021 the government of india launched azadi ka amrut mahotsav to commemorate the 75 years of indian independence which is also being used as an opportunity to accelerate action for wetland conservation with inclusive governance uh the programs uh, we have supported identification of wetland ambassadors these are iconic species habitats or culture monuments which re relate the significance of wetlands and these are identified collectively with wetland mitras and maintaining these ambassadors in good health is also a goal of management plan implementation we have also actively promoted uh, wetland values by placing signages on the values as well as threats of sites these were 75 wetlands across the country were picked up for placing these signages and several community activities including interaction programs rallies clean up and several other public events were held uh, connecting to over 12000 people within one week of uh, the the amrut mahotsav this is one of the signages placed and uh, you can see a snapshot of wetland mitras standing there uh, you know indicating their affirmation to this initiative we have also launched a national wetlands portal which is an information hub uh, this was launched on october 2 2021 and any wetland manager practitioner site managers authorities administrators can log into the website and access all sorts of information currently it has wetland inventories health cards for over 500 plus wetlands a lot of resources and e learning material which can be accessed by general public as well and finally we have created a pledge a pledge to remind citizens of their fundamental duties for conserving wetlands and it has been administered to 10000 plus people uh, in the left side bottom left photograph is our honorable union minister for environment and forest mr bhupinder yadav taking the pledge at wulla which is a ramsar site in jammu and kashmir state uh, jammu and kashmir state this pledge reminds the citizens that the societal assets need to be conserved with proactive involvement of the of the communities uh, this pledge is available on the website we also request you to take the pledge as a mark of your affirmative actions for wetlands conservation the future we will be rolling out the targeted approach to mainstream wetlands in developmental planning by building sectoral convergence we are also supporting innovative public private partnerships to augment resources enhancing the network of ramsar sites is an important and integral part of the agenda so that this network uh, reflects the diversity of wetlands in the country lessons learned and best practices are being collated and disseminated for replication and upscaling at various levels and we are also working to strengthen research management interface to support wetlands conservation and wise use thank you so much and uh please uh we invite all of you to join hands with government of india to support this missive of conserving our wetland resources thank you so much i have to yeah, uh, these are the the virtual challenges thank you dr but again uh these these are very encouraging news from from india i'm i'm particularly intrigued by uh by the wetland portal which is so important um in terms of you know building an inventory checking the inventories whether they are correct and 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 moving towards what Martha explained in the beginning moving towards a a a complete and comprehensive integration of wetlands in NDCs um so we have an we have a second uh, video now which is from the WWF um it's it's entitled freshwater matter the world is facing a crisis Debates are raging about what needs to be done to protect and conserve our rainforests and coral reefs, our lands and oceans. But some of the most important and most threatened ecosystems are often forgotten. 
Freshwater ecosystems cover only 1% of our planet, but they contain more than 10% of all species and are essential to life on Earth. Healthy rivers, lakes and wetlands are vital to societies, economies and ecosystems. They are life support systems for people and nature. Yet, they continue to be undervalued and overlooked by government and global agreements and are being degraded faster than any other ecosystem. The threats will only worsen as the world's population grows and the climate changes. Already we are seeing the disastrous water-related impacts of our rapidly warming world. Historic floods, record rainfall, mega droughts. The latest IPCC reports makes it clear water is at the heart of climate change. We need to transform the way we protect and manage freshwater ecosystems to prevent losing the benefits they provide to people and nature. But we continue to neglect fresh water. Take the current draft of the new global framework for nature. It still focuses on protecting land and sea. Overlooking fresh water is a dangerous weakness. It signals that rivers, lakes and wetlands are of secondary importance, undermining the emergency efforts needed to halt the collapse in freshwater biodiversity and protect and restore these critical ecosystems. They are also absolutely critical to global efforts to tackle climate change. Peatlands, for example, are one of the world's most important carbon sinks. Nature-based solutions will be central to adaptation and building resilience. And the best of these solutions is investing in protecting and restoring the freshwater ecosystems we've got left. Freshwater biodiversity is home to a dazzling diversity of species, from iconic species to those that live out of sight and often out of mind below the surface. And of course, there are countless other terrestrial species that depend on freshwater ecosystems. Despite all this, we've lost one-third of our wetlands in the past 50 years, and 84% of our freshwater species populations over the same period, a far steeper decline than in terrestrial and marine species. This terrible trend will continue if we do not start prioritizing freshwater ecosystems Sustainable Development Goal 6 and its Global Acceleration Framework provides good guidance, but we also need to incorporate ambitious freshwater targets in the new framework for nature. The fifth Global Biodiversity Outlook outlines sustainable freshwater transition to reverse biodiversity loss and its impact on freshwater ecosystems, species and services. An integrated approach must be taken to guarantee the flow of water required by nature and people. Key actions to support this approach include improving water quality, protecting critical habitats, controlling invasive species, and safeguarding connectivity to allow the recovery of freshwater systems from mountains to cost. This transition recognizes the importance of biodiversity in maintaining the multiple roles of freshwater ecosystems to support human societies and natural processes, including linkages with terrestrial, coastal, and marine environments. The post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework can help bend the curve of biodiversity loss by ensuring that freshwater ecosystems are protected, conserved, and wisely used, not only for our generation, but for the generations to come. A sustainable future is not just about land and sea. It's about land, freshwater, and sea. It's about signing up to ambitious goals and targets to reverse the loss of freshwater biodiversity and then working with partners to implement them. Together, we can save freshwater ecosystems and species so they can continue to sustain us. I invite you to work together 
for a robust, ambitious, and inclusive framework for all. Thank you. to the WWF for these inspiring words and, and these beautiful images. Um, we, are, we are turning now, we are, turn, I'm, I'm, we are turning now to our panelists, the most important um, participants in this event. Um, briefly, since we don't have a lot of time, uh, we go through them and then, and then um, we have um, everyone, uh, we have some virtual um, presentations, uh, participations, and, and uh, thankfully, um, uh, three of the speakers are with us here. We have James Dalton uh, with IUCN. He's a director uh, and responsible for global water uh, for the Global Water Program. We have Melanie uh, Heath, who's joining virtually. She's global director of science, policy, and information at BirdLife International. Uh, then we have Hans Schutten, a program head, climate smart land use at Wetlands International. Uh, James Robinson, who joins virtually. Um, he's the director of conservation of the Wildfowl and, 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 and Wetlands Trust. And then Mark Smith, uh, Director General of, of the International Water Management Institute. Thank you for, for, for coming and being with us. Uh, J uh, James, would you? Is that right? Yeah, J James Studd. Sorry, it's like I'm, it's, it's, I'm multitasking here. So. Uh, it's mine. Is it working? Oh, okay. perfect. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, it's a slightly strange listening to myself through my headphones. Um, thanks very much. And, and also, um, great, uh, I can only congratulate uh, the video and the presentation uh, on the work that's been going on in India. Um, I think one of the things I'll start with is just the fact that the decade on restoration does point out wetlands and peatlands and the ecosystems that we're talking about today. But the attention so far has been heavily on that terrestrial forest landscape approach. Now, whilst that's obviously critically important to the, to the future of the planet, one of the things that I think from a water perspective is repeatedly frustrating, but I think is changing, is the opportunity that wetlands and peatlands and these freshwater ecosystems have from a carbon storage perspective, but also in some ways an ease in terms of restoration needs and an and easier approach. And, and some may feel that it's not actually an easier approach, but I'll explain that. Um, one of the difficulties is, and it came up in the video, which was actually, uh, the video was actually a combination of IUCN, WF, and supported by UN Water, is that there is this gap in the overall sustainable development agenda around land and oceans and sustainable development where fresh water is missing within that mixture. And those systems are wetlands, those systems are peatlands. And that's one, uh, that's an element of concern, but it also means that we've got an opportunity right now to really capitalize on growing that space and putting them much more firmly into those considerations when it comes to uh, restoration. And the reason I say that is that you can actually look at those systems and expand and protect them in a way that is quicker, more present, and more uh, visual for decision makers to understand. The difficulties with restoration is we're still waiting for the benefits of that to come. At the moment we're at the pledge stage. Whilst activities are going on, we still need to see some of those benefits from a terrestrial carbon perspective, but also from a biodiversity perspective. Freshwater systems can offer those services right now. And I think there has to be a new agenda looking at protect, but moving far beyond protection to investment in those systems to better management of those systems, of which the Ramsar Convention is part of that solution, but also the restoration agenda as well of those systems, to expand them, to improve the quality of those systems, to remove the pollutant loads that are going into them is a key restoration activity, but actually we don't think about that from a restoration perspective. Rest restoring the quality of those freshwater systems is far, uh, but just as important as it is in terms of expanding them. I think uh, we, we need to get a better understanding over the actual uh, something that Martha said at the beginning, the commitments within the NDCs in terms of what that means for freshwater systems um, and where wetlands and peatlands are f appear in those NDCs. And are they commitments or are we seeing actual alignment and investment in them from the governments themselves, from the parties? And are we seeing finance flow into those that isn't something that takes two to three years to get, but it's finance that can be mobilized rapidly into those systems? 
And so I think one of the things to consider more is that whilst we talked about biodiversity in the video, we have to also look at why carbon is really the main driver here, in particular, obviously, at this conference, but how carbon is the main driver of getting that investment into those systems. And for that, we need to get a better understanding over how those systems can be used to balance emissions, not being used as an, ex as an excuse to avoid decarbonization from countries in the future and ideally to follow some sort of certification scheme so we get a really good understanding of exactly how those systems have been improved and the carbon that is stored and where those systems have to be voluntary, how, those, how that voluntary uh, approach will be made into an actual carbon scheme going forward or linked to a carbon accounting system in the future. We're also probably missing a bit of a trick when it comes to restoration, when it comes to uh, deforestation in the sense that when, the system, when, when, we, when there is deforestation taking a uh, place, we don't consider enough in terms of the peatland soils that are underneath it or the wetland systems that are around those areas, how they need to be part of that restoration agenda rather than just the terrestrial forest ecosystems as well. And that's actually got huge benefits for biodiversity and huge e e uh, benefits for carbon systems as well. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful, oh, wonderful, James. Yes, there, are, there, are, um, there are landscapes beyond forests which are absolutely important, in particular uh, the wetlands. And we are going to talk a little bit more later on, also about the, the what you mentioned. You know, it's like the 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 key crucial link between uh, the action and the finance, and maybe you know some certification schemes and and and, and can help you. Um, I would give the floor now to Melanie, um, if that's okay. Um, well, welcome, welcome, Melanie, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? It's a pleasure to join you uh, today uh, remotely. Um, yeah, there's a few points I would really like to, to highlight. First of all, um, to say a little bit about BirdLife International for those of you who may not know us. Um, we are the world's largest conservation partnership for nature and we work across 115 different countries, many of which focused and working on wetland conservation, identification and management issues, um, including through the network of Ramsar sites. Um, just a few uh, elements of context, I think, in relation to this event being at the UNFCCC COP. Um, we've been hearing a lot about nature in the negotiations and in the discussions here. And I think it's really important to remember that there is no viable route to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees without nature. And of course, that includes and has to include wetland systems. Um, we've heard from earlier speakers about the importance of that in terms of working with and for local people and respecting human rights, particularly of indigenous peoples and local communities. And I think also essential to highlight in the context of this discussion around nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches um, to climate what we are proposing and what we are undertaking is very much in parallel and not instead of an urgent fossil fuel phase out and economy wide emission reductions. I'd like to um, just reflect a little bit on an event I was moderating yesterday in the blue zone actually which had a fantastic lineup it was organized by the RSPB which is BirdLife in the UK together with the uh, Environment Agency. And it was really focusing on this sort of question of readiness, the question that there are huge numbers um, of examples around wetland conservation, restoration, protection and management projects already in play. We shared a lot of experience around learning lessons around the importance of stakeholder engagement and political will of the urgency, you know, hearing from example from the Cayman Islands, you know, they haven't got 30 years to wait until we have these systems properly uh, in place and managed. Um, and we were hearing examples from China, from South Korea, um, from the UK, and from the Cayman Islands in this regard. I think the financing is a really critical point. And one thing I'd like to highlight is a new initiative, a regional flyway initiative that was launched both in uh, Kunming at the part one of the Biodiversity Convention um, very recently, together with a relaunch here in Glasgow which is really around bird life collaborating with the Asia Development Bank and the East Asia Australasia Flyway Partnership Secretariat around a transformational initiative to protect and restore 50 to 100 wetlands across the East Asian Australasian Flyway. And the plan is for this initiative for the first time in history 
through blending both public and private finance with mobilization of between two to five billion over the next 20 years with both nature and the flyway as the organizing principle of this approach. And of course that aims to protect and restore key biodiversity habitat which is necessary for the flyway to function as well as all the ecosystem services around that such as food production, water filtration, climate mitigation, adaptation and so on. And that's the first time I think that there's been an initiative sort of launched at this scale and we really want to look to see how this approach of effective blended finance could be um, also um, work in other uh, flyway approaches working hand in hand. Just to close, I'd like to like just sort of a few reflections in terms of kind of calling for further action around wetland restoration. I think in the context of the COP here, we're obviously looking and hearing about the international commitments that are being made. I think it's really important that we are focusing not just at the events around nature, but we are finding that language finds its way into the decision text that is emerging from this COP, including the cover text, for example, that's being negotiated right now, um, making sure that nature is properly recognised uh, within that decision. I think many of us who've been at COPs for a number of years are seeing nature much more centre stage than we previously have, but let's see that reflected in the decisions that emerge from the COP, as well as the really important financial pledges and declarations that we've been seeing over the last days. I think the link to the Biodiversity Convention, which we also saw featured in the uh, film by WWF, as well as Martha's really important opening words about how the conventions work synergistically together around uh, this uh, really important wetland conservation and restoration area, and really ensuring that those plans and strategies are working domestically. The national adaptation plans that we're hearing a lot about here at COP, national determined contributions, and the uh, uh, the NVSATs under the Biodiversity Convention and, of course, the Ramsar strategy are all interfacing as we look to the next decade of conservation and management against these new and really important frameworks. And, of course, I think wetlands provide a truly unrivaled opportunity to deliver across these shared goals related to biodiversity, to sustainable development and to climate. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Melanie. Um, uh, this was this was uh, again really encouraging. This is um, good. It's not at the end of the day, you know, like it's not about this event. It's about getting the action through. You know, it's like this is a decade of restoration. If we either take it, or you know, it's like, or this is a touchstone that we have to meet, or 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 you know, it's like the the climate as as you know, all the projections will we we will fail. Um, so so this is uh, it's now or never. Hans, uh, would you would you take the floor, please? Thank you, Moritz, and I think this is coming through quite nicely. I was really inspired early on by Dr. Bharti talking about the experience in India, and we're standing shoulder to shoulder already with you there to ensure that wetlands are, are critically in included in the NDCs. Think about the Himalayan water towers where water comes off the mountains and not only provides food and, and provides water for the people, but also um, this is really integrated in the landscape, and this is critically Sorry, and this is critically to do this. Thank you. Um, my tech guys in the back are doing an amazing job for me to make sure that everybody can hear me, and this is better. Um, what I hear from the previous speakers as well is it include important to have wetlands and peatlands being more central stage, and we actually see this happening. This 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 um this session is actually held live from the peatland pavilion, and this is the first time at COP that we've got a peatland pavilion dedicated to peatlands coordinated with the under the global peatland initiative and with multiple partners is is critical and we are getting peatlands back on the, on the stage again it's really nice to see you as wetlands international last year we launched a report about locking carbon in wetlands and enhancing climate action by including wetlands in ndcs because only if we include wetlands truly in the ndcs we set ourselves on the pathway to delivering actions on wet these um, on these wetlands because we're embedding in ndcs we then get into the action plans and this is critical into the, the future and definitely critical into the next day um, next decade talking about targets which are absolutely critical as martha said 25 million um, um, hectares of peatlands, drained peatlands need to be restored by 2030. 
The report really clearly states, and is on the Ramsar website, that to make the Paris Agreement targets, we need to restore 50 million hectares by 2050. That's an easy one, 50 by 50. And an easy target to get in your brain, but let's focus on that. If we then drop to wetlands such as mangroves, we need to increase the um, we need to increase um, the area of mangroves, a completely underrated wetland habitat, by 20% by 2030. So it's clear that we need to get these targets in there, and we need to start and move on from talking about it to doing it. As Wetlands International, it's very clear that we need to do it, and we need to st start getting on with it, but we also should. So we should. We can. as We know what, how to bring wetlands into the NDCs. We're standing shoulder to shoulder with governments and with institutions to do that. But we also know how to restore wetlands and bring them back into functionality, not only for nature, not only for carbon, but definitely also for people. So these three things are for me cru crucial to move it forward. If I grab one or two of examples, Moritz, if I got a ch the chance for that. Um, for example, in, in peatlands, We've been working in Russia, and the previous session was talking about two examples, one in the Congo and one in Russia. In Russia, over the last 10 years, we've restored over 100,000 hectares of peatlands. So we know on how to do that. But that resulted, and in the future, over the next three years, that results into an emission reduction of 650,000 tons of carbon dioxide on an annual basis. At the moment, we're on, three, on a third of a million tons. We go on to two thirds of a million tons of carbon emission reduced. These are the numbers that matter, and these are the numbers that matter here at COP. When we're talking about mangroves, there's a very clear that we're now putting that knowledge together. The Global Mangrove Watch Platform is a clear um, opportunity whereby the knowledge as you say, in not only in India, but the knowledge across the whole world on where the mangroves are, where the opportunities are, and how we can do that is being brought together. So things like the Global Mangrove Watch are critical, but also how do we turn that into action? And I think if anything for me over the last week, what this COP is about is turning words into action. We clearly see programs such as Building with, with Nature really taking center stage, and we're heavily involved in Asia to delivering that. And lastly, if I talk about the rivers, with the other component of, of, of the wetlands that we talk about, we've been working um, together with our, um, our um, uh, people and our colleagues in Latin America and the office on a major project uh, called Corridor d'Azul, whereby we be, we, we, we've got a program to safeguard the free flow of the three major river and wetland systems, the Pantanal, the Iberia marshes, and the Parana Delta. Huge areas that need to be restored to make meet not only the biodiversity crisis, but also the climate crisis. And lastly, if I then look to the third continent that I haven't spoken yet about, Africa, we've been working very, very intensively into a program whereby it's the, the restoration critically dovetails to people. Bliss or building where um, the, the, the blue lifelines for the secure pro pro health, Sahel program, we links water, people, and wetlands together, because only that, by working together with people and creating livelihoods and long-term sustainable situations, we really can make forward. So I'm really incredibly proud to sit here and talk here, but I think we need to turn all these words into real action on the ground. And as Wetlands International, the global uh, conservation and uh, nature protection organization on wetlands, we're standing shoulder with shoulder with businesses and with governments to do that. Thank you, Moritz. Th thank you, Hans. Uh, thank you, Hans. This was really interesting, and and uh, I yeah, you know, like I I know it from firsthand working, having worked for many years with Wetlands International. They're really they're really an institution that brings action to the ground, um, and on all the continents. It's 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 quite spectacular. So that's clearly beyond the blah blah blah. What's you know, it's like what 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 what, what some fear is. You know, it's like the essence of 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 those negotiations. Um, so thank you for that. Also, thank you for reminding us that it's 50 by 50. So we need 50 million um, uh, hectares of restoration by 2050. Uh, this is, uh, and we need a head start um, in this coming decade. So this is this is uh, this is quite ambiguous. Uh, we do need, you know, according to estimates, we do need uh, 30 billion, um, uh, 30 billion US dollars from now until 2050 to finance this. Uh, we need 50 billion for mangroves alone. 
Um, so that is something that we are going to talk a little bit more about finance in a minute. Uh, but first, I want to give the floor to James, uh, the other, our other James, James Robinson, uh, who joins uh, uh, virtually. Thank you, Moritz. Um, I'm, I'm not going to repeat what others have said. And, and what I'm going to do now is, is take a bit of a bird's eye view of this whole situation. Um, last week, I was in Glasgow all week, but now I've returned to the banks of the River Severn here at the headquarters of WWT, an international wetland conservation organisation, and back into some wetlands. And it's wonderful to be here as the migratory water birds are starting to return to this part of the world. And I was greeted this morning by a few Buick swans, the first ones of the winter that have returned to the wetlands here on the Severn Estuary. Now, the Ramsar Convention is 50 years old uh, this year, um, but my organization, WWT, is 75 years old. And I was reflecting that both of our institutions' organizations were set up originally to conserve and promote waterfowl habitat. And that's as important now as it has ever been. Our agendas, of course, have expanded, and I spent much of last week talking about the issues that we've heard about this morning. And it's important that we cover that wider conservation agenda. But we must also not forget that the decade for ecological restoration mustn't miss the chance to help those wetlands on the migratory flyways for these water birds and to help them to adapt to and become resilient to a changing climate. Now, water bird populations and their distributions have always changed, but that rate of change that they are having to face now is unprecedented and we have to give them the best chance to be able to adapt in this world that we are facing. And those Buick swans that I mentioned that come to Slimbridge every year, they're coming in smaller and smaller numbers because we know that the Northwest European population of these birds, their distribution is shifting eastwards. And that's the same for lots of other types of species. There is change that is happening to them and they are having to deal with that. So there are other changes, changes in breeding ranges, changes in the timing of biological effects the mistiming of ecological events, sea level rise, changes in rainfall, the numbers of issues that these water birds are having to face are significant. Now, we as a scientific community, of course, understand more about what this is gonna look like in the future. And some of the climate envelope mapping work that is being done helps us to understand what is likely to happen and how conservation can help these species to be able to thrive in different types of uh, climatic change. So how can we help this decade? Well, we've heard about all of the ideas about um, how we can finance and bring to bear all those things that need to be uh, done to help people and wildlife change into and, and deal with this change in the climate. But for these water birds, I, I just wonder whether we need something which might be considered to be better, bigger and more connected. So let's look at those Ramsar sites that we have, the important areas for these types of species. Let's make sure that we improve the site management to make sure those places remain safe and sound for those water birds. But let's also restore those habitats around these places. Let's make them as resilient as we possibly can. And let's make sure along those flyways that we have a coherent network of sites with new areas created to make the space that these water birds are gonna need in a changing climate. So my parting word, which I've used before in this uh, conference is let's use this uh, decade of ecological restoration to build back wetter. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thank, thank you, James. Uh, thank, thank you, James. I did not know that the trust has been in existence for 75 years. That's, that's very encouraging. That's very good news. Um, it's 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 also I think it's very important to remind ourselves that we do yes there's plenty to talk about and think about governance framework and how to move into the millions and restoration how to scale up but there are institutions there are you know it's like islands of of knowledge like the Ramsar like the Ramsar Convention uh, like actors like as 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 all of yourselves 
you know, like where we can where we can harness the knowledge that's there and and, and build from there. I think that's that's very important um, if we think of how to put things in action and and reach scale. Mark, um, would you would you take the floor, please? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm from the International Water Management Institute, uh, which is a research for development organization. So we work on applied research. Um, we're a, an IOP in the Ramsar Convention, so so really pleased to be part of this event and grateful to the Ramsar Convention and in, indeed our, our fellow IOPs for, for bringing us all together to discuss this critical topic. You know, as an IOP, IMI is maybe a little different than the other organizations that we've heard from today. Our, our business is, is, is research and data, but, but applying that as well. So we seek to work very much in complement with our other IOPs and including on on this agenda of, of wetland restoration. So the, the perspective that I wanted to bring uh, to this discussion today, it hinges really on, on the idea of wetlands as natural infrastructure, um, and that therefore restoration is an opportunity to drive new investment, new financing, and new action on, uh, on, on wetland restoration in order to strengthen the, the infrastructure that, that we need to meet the, the Paris Agreement, to meet the SDGs and, and so on. Um, so wetlands have this infrastructure role. They provide set of services that are important for climate resilience. We've probably heard lots of talk about that in the last 10 days. Um, but the angle I wanted to, to, to bring to this discussion was there are also infrastructure for three securities. So food security, water security, and climate security. And these three securities, I think, are really notable because they're, they're codependent. So if one is weak, they're all weak. Um, and the really interesting thing is that wetlands, of course, contribute to all three very strongly. Um, so wetlands, they, they help ensure that these three securities stay in alignment and they stay together and they stay, they stay robust together. Um, so, so why is that? Well, consider that, of course, wetlands, they, they sustain fisheries, they, they provide proteins in diets, they, they provide diversity in diets for, for, for many, many people around the world. So that's the food security piece. They help supply drinking water, they help mitigate water pollution, they reduce exposure to water risks, floods and droughts and so on. That's the water security piece. And they, as we've been hearing about, they store carbon, um, they provide jobs and income, they help people cope, therefore, with the with, they help people mitigate climate change while coping with the impacts of climate change. So they help with climate security too. So, so therefore, as we're looking at how, um, uh, how investment in, in infrastructure is going to grow as, uh, in response to the, the need for climate adaptation, climate resilience, and as climate finance gets to work on that, that agenda and other sustainable finance mechanisms, there's a strong, there's a really strong case to be made for uh, restoring wetlands and investing in restoring wetlands um, as natural infrastructure for these. Oh, you've got all got headphones on. That's fine. Uh, for for these three securities, um, and I want to give one very quick example of that. So I'm I'm lucky enough to live in the city of Colombo, um, and wetlands play a critical role in the natural infrastructure of Colombo, uh, and in fact. Colombo is one of the first Ramsar wetland cities, and it's a region subject to lots of flooding, including potentially this week, uh, happening right now, uh, with lots of rain there this week. Um, but Colombo has this fantastic natural asset, this fantastic hydrological asset, which is the, the urban wetlands that are woven through the city. Um, and inevitably, as the city has grown really rapidly in the last 20 or so years, um, a lot of those wetlands have have indeed been, been infilled and lost. But there's a, there's a growing awareness and awakening, including at the, government, the level of government, that, that letting that happen is a mistake. Um, and that restoring those wetlands in the city will help absorb floodwaters and absorb the, the, the threats to economy and the threats to people that that, that implies. Um, and so there's, there's a commitment from government to a moratorium uh, in wetland infilling, and, and we need to see that followed through, clearly. Um, but also a, a huge opportunity as we approach the decade of, of wetland, of the decade of restoration to, to uh, drive forward a restoration agenda for Colombo. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, dialogue around doing that. Um, so we've heard, just to, 
just to try and finish off, we've heard uh, the importance in the in the decade of restoration that the emphasis on is on rapid, is on rapid scale up of restoration. A key attractor for for investment in that rapid scale up can be this infrastructure angle, can be the infrastructure benefits that it brings to cities, um, but also that it brings to 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 vulnerable people more broadly, uh, in terms of those three securities: water, food, and climate securities. Uh, whether that's in rural communities or urban communities. Um, at IMI, uh, we're continuing to work with the, with, the Colombo, with the communities around where we live in, in Colombo on a wetland restoration agenda for the city. Uh, we're continuing to work with our partners, IUCN and others, on, on mobilizing the data and tools that we need to weigh up those invest investments uh, and weigh up nature in those investments in, in, in ways that, that help break open the barriers to, to incorporating nature in investment um, uh, uh, plans, um, and so that we can do a much better job going forward, and I, I think also including driving this restoration agenda uh, by having infrastructure planning incorporate nature in a strategic sense across basins, uh, uh, in integrating storage into that that's, that may be built, but it, it, will, it will be natural and it will include groundwater and so on, and thereby, alongside our IOP partners, and I and I hope, in conjunction with the with the with the good processes that the Ramsar Convention leads and catalyzes, we'll be able to contribute our capacities to this to this decade for restoration. So thank you. Thank thank you thank you, Mark, for uh, um, raising for for helping us uh, focus a little bit on on resilience and on infrastructure. So if we are to reach 50 million at some point, we also need to think about you know it's like. Where are these sites, and how do we get there? Is everything about um, uh, you know no take, no touch zones? No, probably not. It's also it's important to see that this is not just something good to have, but a zero sum game, something expensive to have. But it's something uh, it's something to to help us establish an infrastructure uh, that is resilient. So we need a blue resilient infrastructure, and wetlands are a key factor of it. So so this is something you know it's like even that from an I don't know, business case understanding or economic uh, growth understanding is something um, absolutely fundamental. Thank, thank you for this. Um, talking about, uh, I want to talk now, we, we have two more speakers before we go into the uh, discussion. Uh, one is um, Natalie, Natalie Roth, um, who is, who is uh, a founder and, and managing director for Climate. She's an expert on finance um, and, and on, on blue finance. Uh, and then we are talking. We're going to talk a little bit more about enabling conditions uh, when it comes to government and non-state actors. Uh, so we're having uh, Tony Juniper, who is virtual um, presence, and talks a little bit about. Um, hopefully, helps us a little bit guide um, what you know. It's like how the interaction, how this this decade uh, can work, and and as a as a public-private partnership. Um, thank you, Natalie. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Moritz, for the introductions, and thank you very much for um, Wetlands International and Ramsar Convention to invite me to speak here today. Um, well, I've got uh, only five minutes to speak about a very important topic, which is basically fin finding the finance to scale up the conservation and restoration of wetlands to the significant amount we need, as you just pointed out, Moritz. And this, this is not an easy task, so I can only provide some cornerstone thoughts on how we can arrive there. I think Mark has already make, made a really nice introduction on how to integrate nature-based solution into infrastructure finance, which is a very important angle to scaling up uh, finance for, for, for wetlands. But also, I, I would also like to talk about other things, other movements we see at the moment. One is, of course, what uh, has also been pointed out already, showing investment models into um, uh, wetlands. And uh, so far we have always seen financing concentrating on already protected area on the Ramsar sites. But as uh, uh, the gentleman from um, India also pointed out, in India, for example, there are 77,000 wetlands and only 47, not only already, already 47, but the scale is different, uh, uh, are only on the Ramsar. So there are many more wetlands that are out there that need to be protected, prevented from being drained, 
And for that, we need to have new business models, business models that integrate the value of the ecosystem services that wetlands provide. And here we are well aware of the many benefits, the many ecosystem services. We can value them, but in the end, we need to find somebody who is, uh, who is willing to pay for it. And that's the crucial element, who is willing to pay for the ecosystem services. And here we are really at the beginning. We have some services like the carbon mitigation, which is uh, can tap into established markets like the carbon markets, which really see a re revival at the moment, where we really can start to integrate the sale of carbon credits again into uh, investment models of uh, um, restoring and conserving uh, wetlands. So that is very important. So we have seen the carbon markets, the voluntary carbon markets, for example, over the last year, increasing 80%. It reaches about uh, 1 billion US dollars now globally for all sectors, about 100 million for uh, the landscape sector and prices range of course uh, uh, between five and ten dollars up to twenty dollars depending on the, the if it's an afforestation reforestation activity they can command higher prices or, or if it's an um, avoided emission activity so we really see the new the carbon markets taking up again and being a reliable in, uh, parameter in finding new ways of finance wetlands as well so, but uh, not alone the carbon markets, the voluntary carbon markets, but generally the move towards establishing a carbon price. So many governments are now thinking uh, uh, of establishing carbon pricing mechanisms. This can come in form of a tax. It can come in form of an emissions trading system. These carbon pricing mechanisms often uh, they involve, uh, in, in case of a tax, they involve a way to um, generate revenue streams for the governments uh, in form of emissions trading. They generate also ways to get revenues from the sale of um, emission allowances. So money comes into central budgets again, comes into government budgets again, and they are then also being spent on uh, sites that are, for example, under Ramsar. So we see the budget there going up in the future when countries move towards get, setting up carbon prices. That's why that's important as well. Um, I just want to say, take my last two, <laughs> two minutes to talk about another mo uh, uh, angle we see really coming up and that can drive up also finance for wetlands, which is the uh, markets for s uh, bond, the, 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 gl the global bond markets, the global sustainability bond markets, and of course a par portion of that being the blue bond markets. And here we uh, see really um, good indications that wetlands, uh, are being integrated into these bond markets, the sustainability bond markets. And this by a way where, for example, the, the, the taxonomies that are, uh, and, and the standards that are underlying this, uh, these bond markets uh, in, integrate now the definition of wetlands into what is a sustainable act, uh, activity. I can really say now here, um, uh, citing basically the example of the e European Union, which has set up the European taxonomy, which uh, includes the wetlands under the climate adaptation angle uh, uh, of the taxonomy, and really citing the restoration of wetlands uh, as a sustainable activity, especially the taxonomy re refers to wetlands, meaning land matching international def definitions of wetland or peatland as set out in the Ramsar Convention. So it, it immediately refers to the Ramsar Convention in key taxonomies that are driving the global bond markets, the global sustainability bond markets, and also uh, uh, also blue bonds. Are, if I have a minute to re still reflect on those, I mean the blue bonds. Uh, uh, we have seen them now. I think four, four, or five major transactions on blue bonds, starting with the small Seychelles blue bonds. Chi China has issued a. 900 million blue bond, and now uh, in August, the Asian Development Bank has issued 350 million of blue bonds, which all can integrate also wetland restoration, conservation activities in the portfolio of activities that are financed by the bond. And really the bond markets have uh, the potential that I see at the moment as one of the most promising because uh, it is able to tap the capital from the large institutional investors. Large institutional investors will not invest in a small carbon project here or there, or in a small impact fund here or there. Large institutional investors like insurance companies, reinsurance companies, uh, um, pension funds, they invest largely at the moment in 
bond structures, sustainability bond structures or blue bond structures, if they come, become more familiar with it. And there we talk about billions of dollars, uh, not only a couple of millions. And that's what we really need to, to reach this scale. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, this was really helpful to, to give us a little bit of um, a background. Uh, a, a crash course on um, on finance, on wetland finance. Um, doc, Dr. Abad, uh, can we have we have one one more presentation and then and and would you like um, come or, or or come here if you wanna if you wanna talk right now. Um, um, Oh, oh yeah. So it, it it has to be different. So this is this is set up. So we are you know it's like it's it's it's, it's complicated. Um. Uh. Moreover, um. Uh, t Tony has been waiting too long. Um. Already, Tony is the chair of Natural England. That's the UK government's um uh, senior advisors on uh the the natural environment in England. Um. So he's 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 best prepared to talk uh, a little bit more about how um government action. Um, can help, um, you know, it's like action on the ground uh, for this decade of restoration. Uh, Tony, uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you very much. And I'm sorry not to be there with you in the Peatland Pavilion. I was actually there in Glasgow until yesterday, but I had to come back to England to um, engage with business here for a few days. But um, I was very encouraged uh, during my time in Glasgow over the last few days to see some really major shifts taking place in this whole sustainability discussion and a couple of things that I think are really palpable at the moment and which really give us some cause for enormous hope is the extent to which finally there really is a discussion now about we the ways in which we can and must integrate the climate change and nature agendas. These emergencies are very closely related to one another and so are the solutions to them both. And it's been said today at this meeting as well, the extent to which we will gain so much more if we can find ways of putting our uh, remedies uh, into the into the same, same set of actions. And at the same time, as that realization uh, has become more apparent, we also have this shift in the discussion going on whereby we are talking less and less about only conservation, and protecting those places that are important and which remain and now getting into this discussion about recovery and this is really very important indeed and not to be underestimated in terms of the significance of that and the last speaker just reminded us now of the opportunity to be driving billions of dollars into this process of recovery and again there you can see a major shift taking place which should give us every good reason to think that this is now possible. And I was just thinking, um, as Natalie was speaking about the earlier part of my career back in the 1980s, uh, when I was studying uh, a conservation master's degree and having a lecture about environmental economics. And it was about wetlands and the multiple economic values that wetlands provide for water quality, for water quantity, for flood risk reduction, for drought resilience, for for all of these um, new issues as well now on the table around carbon and as well, of course, uh, relating to biodiversity, which was the original reason why we started looking at wetland conservation 75 years ago, uh, as James reminded us to conserve different species of wildlife. But we've gone so much further now. It's got an economic rationale to it. And that's one reason why so many governments now are getting serious about this agenda, uh, because this is now something which is getting a lot of momentum. And indeed, uh, in England this week, we're expecting our groundbreaking, groundbreaking environment bill to pass into law. And that will have key elements of what we're talking about today, uh, for example, in terms of water quality and also in terms of ecological recovery and bringing new tools, which we will be working with at Natural England, including new spatial planning in the form of local nature recovery strategies. And this will be the template whereby we will start to do this job 
of nature recovery, including wetlands. And for me, as the chair of Natural England, there are really three levels of organisation uh, that come behind these nature recovery strategies. So one is going to be uh, combining the different benefits uh, that we have to get out of nature recovery for carbon capture for water purity, for public health and enjoyment, for biodiversity, for climate change adaptation. If we can plan this well, we can get all of those things. The second level of integration and organisation we have to think about for nature recovery is about combining the different actors, the water companies, the house builders, the local government, the official agencies, the conservation groups, the local communities, the farmers and others to be coming together with a similar agenda at the scale of the entire catchment and landscape. And then the third level of integration and organization we're going to need is around all the different tools. The new environment bill powers that will come this week will be one set. We also have new agricultural policies. We have biodiversity net gain. We have flood risk reduction budgets and policies there. And uh, as was mentioned a moment ago, potentially a large flow of finance, including carbon finance. So if we can integrate the benefits with the actors who will deliver those benefits and with the tools that are going to help the actors to do what they need to do, then I do think we can make some big leaps forward in this coming decade. And boy, do we need to make a big leap forward. Nature is on the back foot. It's been degraded and destroyed to within an inch of its life and in some cases beyond uh, that point. So now is the moment when we have to get serious. But I was very encouraged in Glasgow hearing the dialogue, seeing the appetite, and most importantly, seeing the realisation at the top of government that climate, nature and human well-being go together. And if we restore nature in intelligent ways, we can get such huge benefits, not only for wildlife, but for people, too. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, this was spot on. Uh, that was really helpful. Um, it, it shows us it's also, I, I, I mean, talking about this, it's, uh, there's clarity about the goal, you know, 50 by 50, or you can express it the way you want. Um, there's also clarity about, oh, the, clarity about the need in terms of finance, but it's not coming, you know, the finance is not just flying around. There's a lot more that needs to happen. There's a regulatory sphere that, that governments can help with. You know, there's also that, and local governments are, are, are extremely important in this. If you think about, uh, uh, if you think about clearly restoration, what it needs is first and foremost to identify sites that are, that, that you can restore in the first place. And that is a Herculean task. This is really important. And we need all levels of government and non-state actors um, and international organizations to make this happen. So, so thank you for that intervention. Um, the, the, that was really useful. So she protects if we protect. That was the that was the 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 the, the, the best line that I've learned um, over uh, you know like the, doing this whole COP. Uh, Dr. Butt, you had an um, an intervention. That that <laughs> do you want to come come up here? Thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity once again. And at the outset, I wanted to have a round of applause for all our panelists, the four of them, and those who are also uh, online with us. And to all of you, three important points emerged. Mm -hmm. One was build back better. You said you hit the nail on the head by saying restoration. The second point was about investment. And uh, correct me wherever I go wrong. And the third point was about, uh, you know, coaxing the nature to be with us, to save us from the reverberations of climate change and whatnot. So quickly, in the two minutes that you have given me, the first point, restoration. Restoration can be there. And this I am speaking from my experience of being in the government in my country for more than 30 years now. Restoration becomes a reality when you make it a people's movement. Most important, making it a people's movement. And India walks the talk in this. 
and there are numerous examples to say that we uh, you know have made it a people's movement and this people's movement has to be backed with strong legislation and also strong promotional measures which are aimed at west wetland restoration and uh, we all those uh, the the partners that you are showing here on this standy we are working very closely with them and i see my friend from wetland international uh, nodding and all those uh, you know who are here listed we work very closely with them second point was made uh, so on people's participation it has to be from within your love your affection your care for wetlands your passion for wetlands and that if you are able to trans to to transmit as infectious enthusiasm to all those who matter then it becomes a real uh, people's movement i give you a quick example on mangroves at a time when the world is losing mangroves india has been able to not only hold on to its mangroves mangrove wetlands but also increase the mangrove cover 235 square kilometers have been increased in the last 4 5 years on the part of uh, carbon in the in the wetlands and so on i think we should treat mother nature more respectfully and with lot of care that she deserves we in india we don't see this wetlands or for that matter nature as large receptacle for carbon that some countries will keep on spewing the co2 in the atmosphere and that the mother nature will keep on you know being coaxed to absorb it more and more that's not the way we should treat those more than 200 species of feather friends which arrive in my country we treat them with lot of love respect and as our guests those feathered friends over the central asian flyway and i am sure other countries are also doing their bit for those birds about which one of the panelists spoke who was uh, online he spoke about those water birds and those more than 700000 wetlands that we have uh the third point is about investment so on investment i have to say that you know nobody is giving us throwing any seeds of charity or even otherwise it's very difficult to get investments these days but this has to be as i said people's movement and the governments are doing their bit and i am very proud to say that with little or no support internationally we are still fathoming the cause of biodiversity of wetlands and we are able to hold on to our biodiversity as a mega diverse country mm -hmm. and also enhance our forest and tree cover and in the last 4 5 years we have increased the forest and tree cover by more than 15000 square kilometers with these words once again you know it's all our passion and our infectious enthusiasm that has to multiply to save these wetlands which are as i said not just receptacles of co2 but they are natural beauties which uplift the human spirit and endeavor thank you thank you once again thank you thank you dr abad um uh, this is uh... again it is uh, india and, and everything that you've presented and shown today is really encouraging you know it's like this is a a decade for restoration and it's a decade for india and we can all learn from it so this is this is really good i promise that we have a, a discussion so i'm opening the floor i also give the speakers again the opportunity to say something 
Um, I, we are running out of time, so we have we have maybe two minutes or three. But please, you know, shoot questions or or give comments. Um, this is uh, why we're here for. Um, please. So oh, thank you for uh, giving your uh, thank you for the your speech. And I have a, a question about the South and North Korea case. I work for the German organization, especially Korea Office. Uh, I work for North and South Korea, one land part especially, and we work for the forest project as well. But you know, the North Korea they have a different area. When we, meaning the South Korea or international organization, planted a tree, and people thought we can sell the 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 credit to the carbon market like AR afforestation or deforestation CDM. But if we list, uh, restore or protect the one land, especially Natalie, you mentioned about the blue finance. Do you have any specific uh, name called to that? Especially in Korea, we have Han River Estuary. It's a neutral area and it's very good habitat. But my government and local government, they want to develop. They want to build a tree between the two Koreas soon, meaning when we have a peaceful mood. That means we destroy the one land. How can we uh, reduce the or change the government's mind? Yes, I'm not sure if I fully understand uh, the, the the question or the situation there. Um, but I understood it's about uh, blue carbon in the estuaries and how to value it or how to bring an incentive to the government not to develop it. I mean, there are clear uh, uh, guidelines and methodologies to, to estimate the blue carbon potential uh, under the wetlands chapter of the IPCC, for example. Uh, you can get guidance on how to integrate it into national inventory, if that's the case. Uh, in South Korea, I'm not sure uh, if you include it already in the national inventory. Um, but there are also uh, methodologies under uh, VERA uh, that help you quantify the, the blue carbon value. Uh, but as said, it's not only about carbon, it's about the multiple benefits that are there in such sites. So uh, what I feel also, especially in the coastal zone, the main um, um, uh, argument for getting government on board is also about adaptation value that these ecosystems provide, especially in the coastal zone. They really can reduce the uh, strength of the storms and the winds and the flooding. And this again in involves into a cost saving cost argument for the government, saving future cost of adaptation if you act now and, and seeing also these ecosystems as a cost efficient way to adapt to future climate change. Uh, and the cost that will come with, with future climate change. So for me, often talking to governments on coastal ecosystems, I would first make the case of their value for climate adaptation as well. Uh, thank you, thank you, um, thank you for the question, and thank you, Natalie, um, for for um, uh, this good response. We do have a couple of um, comments. One moment, a couple of comments from from from. Um, uh, the virtual audience. Um, I'm not sure we can all answer them in the t in the one and a half minutes that we have. Uh, but uh, so there's a question on the on the sustainability blue bond mechanism, how this works. To Natalie, this is a really important question. There is maybe we can you know organize the question and and send links to it. You know, it's like this is a this would take longer, but there's good publications out, including from Natalie, uh, that can. Um, uh, that can answer this question. Then a question to Hans is, uh, which is the program you mentioned uh, working or rolling out in Africa? So that's maybe something that's very fast that you can respond to very fast. Oop, thank you, that's better. Um, that's working. The program we're talking about was called BLISS, B-L-I-S-S, the Blue Lifelines for a Secure Sahel, where we work together in the center of Africa to secure water for people, for, for nature, and for climate benefits. So it's called Bliss. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the last question that we have, the floor. Thank you. Uh, it, it goes along the comment you got from the person online. It was a question for you. Uh, how uh, 
big uh, investment fund can get interested in in investing in blue carbon how how does the return on you know in our capitalist system they will invest if they get money back uh, how do we do that well well it depends on what type of big investment funds i mean there are many investment funds of all different kinds and flavor out there and all different sizes so uh, that's now a difficult uh, qu question to answer in, uh, in, in such a broad category. I mean, uh, uh, of course, you have, uh, we talked about business models, finding ways of new sources of revenues. Of course, carbon is one because you can immediately monetize it. That's easy. We have also the, 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 the biodiversity benefits. It's more difficult to monetize them immediately because if, if you, you have to be able to show revenue streams to finance against it. Any any uh, investment fund will tell you yes. We take on board your investment if you can show us that we get our return in the end that we got, or if it's a loan fund that we that you can pay back our loan. So it's about uh, showing clear revenue streams, new revenue streams, or showing also effective saving schemes because we have also seen many funds on energy efficiency. They bank against savings of energy in the future. That's why you make the energy, fish, energy efficiency investment today. So saving future adaptation costs could also be an argument. It's much more difficult than saving energy costs because you don't know how much will be the adaptation cost in the future. They can go up exponentially. Uh, and that's a big unknown. That's why the uh, investing against savings is more difficult than investing against more uh, clear um, uh, direct revenue streams. But so we would need to be a better better case to really <laughs> uh, answer it uh, one, more concretely. Wonderful. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, unfortunately, we have to close this session. It, it was it, 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 Jacka Tamilanda from from um, uh, from the Ramsar Convention. Uh, we'll wrap up in one minute, and then and 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 and, and, and uh, you know, I hope to see you soon again. Uh, thank you, Moritz. Thank you, everyone. Um, um, Thank you to the IOPs, to our panelists, uh, for for sharing amazing efforts and insights. And I have to um, I have to repeat what Marta said at the beginning of this session. Uh, uh, we are fortunate as a convention. The contracting parties are fortunate to have this strong partnership of IOPs, and it's it's quite a unique arrangement. So thank you for all your input here. Um, thank you for showing so well that we can deliver on climate and biodiversity and development goals through this, uh, this uh, set of systems, these wetlands. And I think it's something that has come out very clearly with this COP, much more clearly than anywhere else, that they are a central part of the discussion. And having sat in on plenaries, presidency events, pavilion events, you name it, nature is mentioned centrally every single time. And, and let us see whether that is actually the imprint we have in the formal negotiated outcomes as well. So keep an eye on that and, and hopefully uh, uh, there will be a shift that is beyond the event space and in the negotiated text. Um, we, uh, what came out very clearly here is that we, we know a lot about what needs to be done. We need to set ourselves uh, really clear targets for actions. We've heard about amazing targets and actions. We've heard about the examples to show that it can be done. We have some pointers for how that can be scaled. Is it 50 by 50? Is the commensurate financial targets there? And do we use the systems in place to make that a reality? And I think Tony spoke very clearly on, on some of those points. There are frameworks in place at the national level, the sectoral uh, policy frameworks, the new plans that increasingly can build on and integrate the nature-based efforts in a way that actually achieves multiple outcomes, not without cost, at significant cost, but at an enormous benefit to society. And so having clarity on that, we can actually do much more than has been done before and indeed make the decade for ecosystem restoration a resounding success. And um, perhaps if I can reflect on one point about the restoration and the nature-based efforts that have achieved most attention here is that most of them are fully dependent on also integrating wetlands because they are such a crucial part of the landscape and they're a crucial part of the seascape. The two are very connected. So, so with that, um, 
I close this event. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to those who listened in. And I look forward very much to work with the IOPs and with all of you towards World Wetlands Day next year, towards our Conference of Parties, the 14th, at the end of next year, and towards a very, very good result by 2030. Thank you.